She has enchanted a prince and won over the British public. She's ever the lady, always perfectly dignified, and she's always got a glint in her eye. But once upon a time, Kate Middleton was just a little girl with a royal crush. I wish to marry. Yes, so yes, dear William. She overcame her lack of good breeding. She is a commoner, descended from coal miners. Conquered an elite public school. The boys voted on her looks and her personality, and she got a two out of 10. And had a magical transformation. She was rather scantily clad. And William said, wow, Kate's hot. Before finding true love. It was good fun. We had a really good laugh, and then things happened only to discover that being a royal girlfriend wasn't always a fairy tale. She was photographed leaving her apartment, she was photographed leaving stores, she was photographed on the top deck of a bus. But this bedtime story ends with the ultimate happily ever after for Kate. It was a total shock when it came and so excited. <laughs> the real life Cinderella who became a princess. In 2006, 24-year-old Kate Middleton seemed to have it all. Good looks, an elite education in some of Britain's finest establishments, and on her arm, possibly the world's most eligible bachelor, the dashing Prince William of Wales. Kate was in this fairy tale romance with not just a pretend Prince Charming, but a real prince. She's having the time of her life. She's going to the islands of Mystique and Ibiza. She is skiing in Klosters a glamorous ski resort. She's going to Africa on safari. She wants for nothing, really, when she's with him. Life seems very happy. They're very loved up. At the beginning of 2007, a rumor spread in media circles that William might pop the question on Kate's 25th birthday, the 9th of January. Woolworths was making plates, tea towels were being printed, the paparazzi were all over Kate. <laughs> When Kate tried leaving her house, she could barely get out of the front door. There were so many photographers desperate to get this picture because they all thought this was going to be the announcement day. But the day came and went without an engagement ring. And behind closed doors, a very different story was unfolding. What I was hearing from my sources in the inner circle was that actually the relationship was coming unstuck. Prince William was feeling the pressure from the press and from everyone around him to settle down. I don't think William wanted to settle down. He was still totally wrapped up in his military career. He wanted to do other things with his mates, apart from being with Kate all the time. Their private troubles were soon public knowledge. Occasionally, pictures would appear in the papers of him at a local boozer with a beautiful blonde sitting on his knee. There was one famous incident where he, I think, just accidentally had his hand on um, a girl's breast. Kate could sense that all wasn't going smoothly with the two of them. So when Kate's mobile rang on the 11th of April, it wasn't a complete surprise. My understanding is that he rang Kate when she was working. She got a phone call from Prince William, allegedly saying, look, this is not right, we need to take a break. I spoke with co-workers who heard the conversation, saw her reaction. She was devastated. She was really upset about it. She'd invested an awful lot in that relationship. But Kate comes from tough stock, and she wasn't about to let her handsome prince go without a fight. You go through the good times, you go through the bad times, you know, both, both personally, but also within a relationship as well. She's quite tough, Kate. She calls the shots in that relationship more than I think most people know. I think that's probably a lot to do with her background. Catherine Elizabeth was born in Reading on the 9th of January 1982, the first of three children to Carol and Michael Middleton. She may not have royal blood, but she had other advantages. Her family history was filled with ambition and determination that has propelled them from the depths of a coal mine to the gates of Windsor Castle. Kate is the real thing. She is a commoner descended from coal miners from the northeast of England. Considering a poverty that existed very much in the early Middleton years, what they've now come to do with their lives is really quite impressive. Through sheer force of will, each generation had pulled the family a little higher up the socio-economic ladder. Kate's female forebears were especially tenacious. Kate's great-grandmother, Edith, raised six children by herself. 
She was quite a strict disciplinarian, instilling them in certain fortitude and will to survive. Kate's grandmother, Dorothy Goldsmith, was the first person in the family to actually state she wanted to bring the family out of this working class. She encouraged her daughter to uh, make a life for herself. Kate's mother, Carol, continued her family's upward mobility. Carol was an air hostess, which was a very glamorous job in those days. It was while she was working for British Airways that she met Michael Middleton, who was a handsome young dispatcher. They got married in 1980 in a tiny little village in Buckinghamshire. By the time Kate was born 18 months later, Michael and Carol were living a comfortable middle-class lifestyle. But Carol, like her mother, wasn't satisfied with the status quo. She wanted to give her children what she didn't have, the opportunity to go to a private school. So she started a business to help get them there. Carol found it incredibly time-consuming putting together all the gift bags for her own children's parties. She realized there was a gap in the market. Carol set up this mail order business, Party Pieces. The business was an unexpected hit. It helped the family by moving them up from the middle class to new money. By the time Kate was seven, the Middletons could afford thousands of pounds in fees to send her to the respected St Andrews School in nearby Pangbourne. When Kate was in grade school, she was shy and awkward, but she really pushed through it. She became a superb athlete. As a student, she excelled. And she even got up and acted in a bunch of school plays. Many would later fondly recall one role in particular in a play called Murder in the Red Barn. She performed in a play in which she is a young lady wooed by a handsome blonde prince named William. I wish to marry. To marry me? Will you, Mara? This be all I'd ever longed for. Yes, so yes, dear William. As Kate enjoyed prep school, her family's fortunes continued to flourish. Carol took her talent for making children's goodie bags and turned that into a multi-million dollar online empire. Her mother is driven, and I think Kate does have a great degree of drive. But the Middleton family spirit would be tested when Kate was sent to boarding school for the first time. She went to a school called Down House at the age of 13. She is from an ordinary middle class background, but that education brought her in touch with the elite. Suddenly, the mean girls at school were tripping her, were knocking her books out of her hands. And it got so bad that Kate's parents took her out of Down House. In April 1996, Kate moved to the even more exclusive co-ed public school, Marlborough College. First day, she walks in, a kind of a gangly, tall, awkward girl, and there are a bunch of boys at the other end of the dining hall, and they hold up numbers. The boys voted on her looks and her personality, and she got a two out of ten. But Kate was determined not to become an outcast at her new school. She went away for the summer and she came back looking much more like the Kate we know today. She did her hair, she started using a little bit of makeup, and when everyone saw her, they went, wow! During her four years at Marlborough, Kate matured into a self-confident young woman, but she still found time to indulge in some juvenile behavior. She had a mischievous streak. There are rumors of her flashing her bottom at, at the boys out of a window. She was so famous for this at the school that she became known as Kate Middlebum. Kate's spirited nature and fresh face good looks caught the eye of some of the male pupils, but she had apparently set her sights a little higher. Kate, like many other British girls, was a little bit obsessed with 16-year-old Prince William. Throughout her childhood, when she went to Marlborough College, she had pictures of William on her wall, even though she's recently denied it. No, I had the Levi's. Levi's guy on my wall, not, not a picture of William, sorry. <laughs> sorry. It was me and Levi's, honestly. <laughs> well, in fact, it was William, because I talked to enough of her friends who saw it many, many times. People who were around at the time say that it was always her ambition to meet her prince. And Kate was about to make a life-changing decision that would turn her schoolgirl fantasy into reality. At 19, Kate Middleton's life already resembled a Cinderella story. Born into an ordinary family that had gained considerable wealth and social status, she was educated at an elite boarding school. And in 2001, 
Kate became the first in her family to attend university. She chose one of Britain's finest establishments, St Andrews, the oldest university in Scotland. Its reputation for academic excellence was not its only attraction. It had a great history of art course, it was one of the best schools in the UK, and it didn't hurt that Prince William was going to be there too. Kate wasn't the only one to be excited that Prince William was coming to St Andrews. When the royal undergraduate arrived at university, the normally sleepy town went wild. The world's press descended on this town that had little been heard of. It was really quite incredible. It was called the Will's Effect. There was a mob scene there. <laughs> Thousands of people pressing to see him. Very well. Legend has it that Kate turned to a friend of hers and said, gosh, I feel so sorry for him. How on earth is he going to get through the next few years? It seemed that everyone was swept up in Will's mania, that fate would bring Kate closer to the dashing young prince than his many well-wishers. I mean, there were 14 dorms at St. Andrews, and Kate and William ended up in St. Salvador's together. It was only a matter of when, really, they would meet because they were taking the same course as well. And on the very first day of lectures, Kate came face to face with her childhood crush. Kate first met William outside the Buchanan Lecture Hall. She sort of did this awkward curtsy, or in the presence, actually, of the, you know, the future king. I actually went bright red when I met you and sort of scuttled off, feeling very shy about, about meeting you. They would take breakfast together. That friendship was forged over those breakfast meetings. Then they started going to lectures together. But at first, the two were simply friends. Kate's quite well known for playing the long game. It wasn't as though she saw Prince William and pounced on him. She was actually dating someone else, a chap called Rupert Finch, who was in the fourth year. Romance didn't seem to be on the cards for Kate and William. She was spoken for. And by the end of their first year, it seemed the prince might leave university altogether. That first year was very tough for William. He wasn't enjoying it. It wasn't what he'd expected it to be. He was very unhappy. He felt isolated the end of the first semester, he actually said to his father, the Prince of Wales, I don't want to go back. It was Kate who kind of pulled him back from the brink, assured him they could make it to... Friend was modeling, and Kate had been asked. Kate was a little hesitant. A couple of those outfits were really rather revealing. The organizer said that they really had to convince her to do it. And she's, she's game for a laugh as a girl, so she thought, yes, I'll do it. On the 27th of March 2002, guests packed the five-star St Andrews Bay Hotel, but their eyes weren't on the catwalk. Both the audience and the press were watching Prince William. He bought a $200 ticket, which gave him a prime seat. The crowd forgot all about the royal presence when Kate took the stage. She was rather scantily clad, shall we say. She was in her undies. I mean, certainly not too, um, too, uh, shall we say. <laughs> this supposedly shy, quiet, bashful girl in a see-through black negligee. All the jaws of the boys in the room dropped. The crowd went completely crazy. Everybody erupted into cheers. That catwalk put Kate on the map for good. It was a fairy tale moment for Kate and the prince was enchanted. By this point, Fergus was back in his seat next to William. And William turned to Fergus and he said, wow, Kate's hot. And that was it. He suddenly saw this girl who'd been a part of his university life to date in a completely different light. Later that night, William made his move. They went to a party in Hope Street in the center of town. There was a... Um... A very a jolly party afterwards. And William and Kate had found a sort of quiet corner. And as the evening wore on and the drinks were flowing and the music was pounding... He did what many young men do on such occasions. He went in for the jugular. He went in to kiss Kate. But Kate's reaction wasn't quite what William had hoped for. No, she didn't kiss him back in return. She was still seeing Rupert Finch. But she was experiencing these new feelings, which of course came together with a whole load of things she couldn't even imagine at that stage. I mean, what would it be like dating a prince? Kate's relationship with Finch was soon over. It ended naturally when Rupert graduated and went down to London. With Rupert out of the picture, Kate was free to accept William's overtures, but he didn't ask her on a date. William asked Kate and two other students to live with him in an off-campus apartment. 
I'm sure she was absolutely thrilled <laughs> to death. <laughs> There's no question that that was a huge step toward really getting, getting to know the prince. In the autumn of 2002, Kate and her new flatmates moved into apartment 13A Hope Street. It was hardly a palace, but in these ordinary student lodgings, Kate got a glimpse of the reality of royal life. Every possible security measure to safeguard the prince had been put in place. The shutters were bomb-proof and fireproof. The glass had been taken out and replaced with bulletproof glass. Suddenly, it's a real hard look at reality. I mean, the fact that you are a target for any number of organizations that would want to take you out to make an impact globally. It's a new normal for her. Despite this, behind the high security doors of Hope Street, their relationship flourished. We moved in together as friends, and then because we were living together, we lived with other, a couple of others as well, um, and it just sort of, it sort of blossomed from there, really. They'd often just order in DVDs and takeaways. They would go together to Safeways and buy baked beans and toast, which was Prince William's preferred comfort meals. I think what attracted William to Kate was just the fact that she's so down to earth. She's got a great sense of humor. She's always got a glint in her eye. She's got a really nice sense of humor, which kind of helps me because I've got a very dirty sense of humor. Uh, so it was good fun. We had, a, we had a really good laugh and then things happened. As they grew closer, Kate had to adapt to a more restricted way of life. You suddenly maybe have a little less freedom, a little less privacy. You've got to have royal protection officers with you. This was something that apparently Kate got used to much easier than any of Prince William's former girlfriends. In fact, I am told it was tremendously exciting. Um, a bit of a turn on. It, made, it gave him a sort of a, a Hollywood appeal. Kate would also have to get used to William's deep suspicion of the media. William's secrecy is part of his makeup. I think ever since his parents' terrible, sad, very public split. When William started at St Andrews, there was an agreement between the palace and the British media that William would be left alone in return for regular interviews with the press. Despite the media agreement, William insisted that Kate keep their budding relationship out of the public eye. The romance was kept under wraps, amazingly so. They agreed that they wouldn't hold hands in public. They wouldn't sit next to each other at dinner parties. It must have been extremely difficult for a young woman who was going out with this very famous young man not to be able to act like they were going out together. It worked for two years until 2004, when Kate accompanied William on a family skiing holiday. William and his father went on their annual skiing holiday to Klosters in Switzerland. And the convention is that the press are invited to attend a photo call. We would all turn up for this photo call and then we would all leave them in peace. The day after, William appeared on the slopes with this striking girl who, very rapidly, we knew was Kate Middleton. We could see William kissing and cuddling with Kate and I really thought, well, what, what do we do about this? One tabloid couldn't resist the urge to break the news. On April the 1st, 2004, the Sun newspaper got the picture that everyone had been after. The secret was out. After nearly two years of secrecy, Kate was suddenly in the fishbowl. From that point on, there was no doubt in anyone's mind that Kate Middleton was the girl to watch. She took great care not to give the tabloids any easy headlines. I would frequently see Prince William and Kate out and about. Whilst Prince William is quite a big drinker, Kate Middleton was always quite moderate. She was very conscious of the fact that all eyes were on her. She was always very careful before she departed any nightclub to go to the ladies' room and freshen up. So she was not the girl to be seen tumbling out at 3 a.m. in the kind of way that so many British girls do. Kate was not only a flawless girlfriend, she was also a good student. In June 2005, she graduated from St Andrews with a 2-1 in the history of art, alongside her prince. It was an interesting scene because there was Kate's family, of course, but also the royal family. I remember the vice-chancellor of the university speaking that St Andrews had got this reputation for being one of the great matchmaking universities of Britain. And sure enough, we had the most perfect and most famous match of all just in front of him. 
It might have been a fairy tale romance, but a crisis was looming. Upon graduation, Kate would leave the protective bubble of St Andrews and be driven apart from her prince. In 2005, 23-year-old Kate Middleton left St Andrews with more than just a degree in art history. On her arm was her boyfriend, Prince William, considered the world's most eligible bachelor. Living together freely in the small town of St Andrews, the couple's affection for one another had grown. When their studies were finished, Kate's prince gave her an extravagant graduation present. He whisked Kate off to Kenya. He took her to a very private log cabin. They went fishing, they sat by a log fire. It was important for her to love Africa as much as Prince William had grown to, because that would mean that she would be brought closer to him. And luckily, she really did. But on their return from Kenya, Kate's luck began to change. William had everything planned out. He knew he wanted to become an army officer, a pilot, and so he joined Sandhurst, the military academy in the UK. So already at that juncture, their lives were going in very different directions. In January 2006, Prince William went to Sandhurst to begin 44 weeks of officer training. 30 miles away in London, Kate was left to start a new life on her own. We were all watching to see whether this romance would survive post the bubble of St Andrews. This was really crunch time. I think for everyone, there's a very peculiar moment after university when all those glory days and responsibility-free days are gone. Now for Kate, this was doubly the case. Kate now faces the fact that she no longer would be living with William, that she would no longer be under the protection of his bodyguards. William still had the protection of the royal system all around him. So for the very first time, she had to face the paparazzi alone. It was very daunting. She was photographed leaving her apartment. She was photographed leaving stores. She was photographed on the top deck of a bus. This was all absolutely alien to her, and she did suffer with that. To cope with the pressures of the paparazzi, Kate was guided by Princess Diana. One of the most unusual things was that Kate was shown footage of the late Princess of Wales, and this was at the palace's suggestion. She watched footage of Diana getting in and out of cars, walking down the street, having to cope with paparazzi. By watching Diana, Kate learned how to manage her image under intense media scrutiny. But image control and separation from her beloved prince weren't her only worries. As William's girlfriend, Kate was under huge pressure to start a career, but it had to be the right career. She wasn't sure what she wanted to do. She wanted to do something that would use her history of art degree. She'd considered Christie's, she'd considered Sotheby's. You need to have a flexible job, obviously, in case Prince William wants to rush her off to Africa at some stage, or she needs to accompany him somewhere. There was always a difficulty about Kate finding a respectable profession because her actual job was girlfriend to Prince William. And it was a full-time job because she had to be on station at all times for him. The fact that William was steamrolling ahead with his career and Kate was still struggling to find her footing, it didn't have the best repercussions for Kate. The press was ruthless, giving Kate a cruel new nickname. She got labelled Weighty Katie by the press and this was because she was seemingly not doing an awful lot and waiting for Prince William to propose, and it was a moniker that she hated. No girl likes to be perceived as sitting around waiting for the man. Poor Kate was beginning to see the vicious side of the British press. A lady in waiting was hardly a role for a Middleton woman. Nonetheless, while her royal boyfriend underwent military training miles away, Kate had little else to do but wait. They would enjoy snatched weekends together, but they didn't have the same amount of time as they had at St Andrews, so I think the relationship came under new pressures. Seeking time together, the couple chartered a plane to the island of Ibiza, where they were welcomed by an unorthodox host. They visited Kate's uncle, Gary Goldsmith. Every family has a black sheep, and Kate Middleton's is uh, Uncle Gary. Gary had made a fortune in the internet, and he had a pink 
hilltop villa that he called La Maison de Bang Bang. Which is slang for the house of sex, uh, where he was living a very hedonistic lifestyle. They were out clubbing till four or five in the morning. Ibiza's got some of the top DJs in Europe. I think they had a fantastic holiday with Uncle Gary. In September 2006, the couple returned to London, looking tanned, relaxed and happy. For Kate, there was good news on the job front as well. She found a kind of a low-profile job as a junior accessories buyer at Jigsaw, a clothing chain in London. I think this was very much the sort of job that was expected of Kate. It suited her lifestyle. It meant that she could live close to the King's Road. She was mixing with the right sort of people. It wasn't a career as such. It was more a job. Kate's struggles seemed to be coming to an end. William was about to graduate from Sandhurst and Kate was invited to the parade, marking the end of his training at the academy. When Kate was invited to the passing out parade at Sandhurst, it was a key indication of how serious this relationship was. Not only was Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall going to be there, but the Queen as well. The passing out parade at Sandhurst is the most important date of the calendar and the fact that William had invited Kate and her family there was very significant. That was the prince very firmly saying, she's in my life now, not just as a casual girlfriend, but, but in a very formal, um, you know, potentially permanent way. The ceremony was a day full of military pageantry, tradition, and for Kate, royal eye candy. It's a very colorful affair, lots of flashing sabers, young men in their uniforms all looking frightfully smart and pristine, lots of stamping around, sorry, marching, should I say. Kate was absolutely bowled over to be there. She couldn't stop smiling, and when she caught sight of William, she said to her mother, my goodness, doesn't he look sexy in his uniform? But while Kate admired the view, the media focused on her mother's less than regal behavior. Carol Middleton, when the cameras panned in on her face in the crowd, um, it was revealed she was uh, chewing gum. There are certain things that are just not acceptable around the Queen, and frankly, chewing gum is one of them. Carol was actually chewing Nicorette gum. She was trying to give up smoking. The following morning, the papers pounced on Carol's gum-chewing faux pas, and that wasn't all. She was accused of calling the restrooms a, a toilet, of using other phrases that were not considered appropriate around the Queen. It was a difficult situation. They were being so closely scrutinized. I think it was all part of the press's attempt to make it look as if the Middletons, the commoners, had somehow stepped out of their league. She'll never live down that day, I'm afraid. I think Kate's very close to her family, so she's not going to be embarrassed or humiliated by her family. But I think it's very clear that it's not just Kate that needs to learn royal protocol. While the press attacked Carol Middleton, her daughter's reputation remained unscathed. In fact, many royal watchers thought they heard wedding bells. Following William's graduation from Sandhurst, there was no question in the mind of the British people that Kate was the one. The only thing that remained was determining when William would actually formally ask for her hand in marriage. But behind the scenes, problems were beginning to surface. William had spent Christmas with his family. He was meant to go for New Year with Kate and her family up in Perthshire in Scotland, but he decided to stay with his family instead. So here poor Kate was having to ring the New Year in all by herself. And that's when Kate really knew something was wrong. And it wasn't just a missed family gathering. By the beginning of 2007, there were some quite serious cracks that were beginning to develop in the relationship. She was seeing less and less of him. He was living an army lifestyle. He was going out, he was drinking, there were plenty of girls on the scene. He just overstepped the mark a bit, really, with a couple of trips to nightclubs where he was photographed with attractive blondes. Kate, meanwhile, was in London, working hard. She had her head down. And she was upset, and understandably so, that William was behaving like this. Royal men tend to be first and foremost selfish, and they do things their way. And if there's any lesson that Kate could have learned from history was, you have to go along with that, or you're left by the wayside. In February 2007, Kate welcomed William back to London for a week of R&R, &R, and what promised to be a very romantic Valentine's Day. She had every reason to think that year that there would be an announcement. She was certainly telling her close friends that she expected 
him to give her an engagement ring. Prince William handed Kate a beautiful little package tied up with ribbon. But the box didn't contain what Kate had hoped. It was not the ring that she expected, but a very beautiful uh, compact. Still, I think that was a big disappointment to her. When he began to have doubts about him and Kate, they'd been together for such a long time at that stage, the assumption, not just um, among his friends, but even among his family that they marry, w w was overwhelming. And I think William is one of those people who doesn't like being second-guessed. William had all the pressure, because not only was he choosing a wife for himself, hopefully someone that he would stay married to for the rest of his life, but he was choosing a Queen of England. In early April, William sought advice from a veteran of royal romances. William went to his father, Prince Charles, and said, look, I'm 25, I'm too young to get married, I just can't commit at this point. And Charles, who was by then very, very fond of Kate, said it is not fair to this young lady to do this to her. You cannot string Kate along anymore, and you should just break it off. On the 11th of April, Kate was at work when she received the dreaded call. It seemed her Cinderella story had come to an unhappy end. But while Kate may have been down, she was definitely not out. The prince was worth fighting for. In April 2007, 25-year-old Kate Middleton was left reeling when Prince William broke off their five-year relationship. But Kate was made of sterner stuff and she was not about to let her Prince Charming slip away so easily. I think Kate decided on an interesting strategy after they split. I'm not sure whether she set out to win William back, but what she did decide was, I'm going to show him what he's been missing. Now this involved wearing very low cut or very short dresses. She was photographed two or three times a week it seemed at the time out in Chelsea nightclubs. And of course this time she was going alone. While Kate hit the town, William was holed up at an army base in Dorset. He had one night out in a nightclub where he'd said he was free. I remember uh, writing about this, I'm free, he said. But Kate was freer, if you like. And their story soon began to circulate that she had no shortage of handsome young men by her side. I think it's quite smart that she wasn't shy about that. She was showing people that she does have a life, she does have friends, and it was a way for her to show the world that she's not just a prince's girlfriend that's just sitting minding her P's and Q's. And Kate wasn't just having fun. In 2007, she got a chance to flaunt her athletic skills for a good cause. Kate was approached by an old friend called uh, Emma Sale, who was organising a charity row across the English Channel from Dover to France, all women and all raising money for charity. Sure enough, Kate was joining the sisterhood, as they called themselves, in this Viking-type ship on their practice sessions on the River Thames. It suddenly became, with Kate's involvement, very high profile. But Kate wasn't the only headline-grabbing member of the sisterhood. There was some intriguing background in regard to some of the members of the sisterhood. Emma actually runs an upscale sex club called Killing Kittens in London, and she's very famous for this. That certainly raised eyebrows at the palace. It might have raised eyebrows, but joining a group of independent women was good for Kate. It would have been quite nice for her and good for her confidence to suddenly be with this really strong, fun group of girls that were setting out on a challenge that nobody would have ever thought they could do. All of this just elevated Kate's profile. And I think the message really to William was very clear. It was, look at what you're missing. Just months after breaking up with Kate, William got the message. Within eight to ten weeks, William was crawling on his hands and knees to get her back. In June, I'd been told that they had quietly gotten back together. Unfortunately, reuniting with William meant Kate had to make some sacrifices. It was announced abruptly that Kate was withdrawing from the sisterhood, but that can only have been William saying, enough of this, I don't want you in these revealing t-shirts, parading in front of photographers, you're my girlfriend, let's put the last few weeks behind us and get back to where we were. On the 24th of August, when the sisterhood crossed the channel and raised £100,000 for charity, Kate wasn't there to cheer them on. 
William whisked her off into an exotic holiday in the Seychelles. Which had the star-studded history, of course. Mick Jagger and David Bowie used to go there. And it was here that they made a pact about their future. And William told Kate he would one day marry her. It was the commitment she'd wanted, and she was happy to wait. They had a great time. Uh, they came back looking tanned, relaxed, happy, and, and things were back on, on, on an even keel. And this time round, the palace took note. I think they had no choice but to really sit up and take note of this relationship. So effort was made to really bring Kate into the royal fold. For me, the best example of her new status was when William became a Knight of the Garter. He never would have been able to bring an ordinary girlfriend, but here Kate was invited to it. And the outfit worn for this particular ceremony is rather amusing. I mean, it's a long velvet coat, it's a floppy velvet hat with a huge ostrich plume. As William comes into view in this getup, Harry and Kate are just dying of laughter, doubled over. But as Kate grew closer to William's family, she was about to be betrayed by one of her own. Undercover reporters posing as British tourists in Ibiza hung out with Gary and exposed his lavish lifestyle. They videotaped him chopping cocaine, offering them drugs and prostitutes and bragging about his connections with the royal family. This landed on the front page of the tabloids throughout England. He was bragging about the fact that he would ultimately become, he believed, the uncle of the future king. It was awful for the Middletons. Carol was devastated. Kate was so embarrassed and was understandably very nervous about how this was going to go down with the royal family. Prince Charles stepped in to counsel Kate. Charles had some advice. He said, look, this too shall pass. And for the time being, just stop reading the papers because that's what I do. Prince Charles was right. It did die down. In the old days, the royal family almost certainly would have insisted that William called this relationship. But times had changed. They basically supported Kate throughout this. It was a sure sign that they considered her one of them. After training as a search and rescue force helicopter pilot, Flight Lieutenant William Wales joined 22 Squadron at RAF Valley on Anglesey. Kate now faced life as a military girlfriend. When Prince William was doing his RAF training, Kate moved in with him in a small but very secure cottage in Wales. He and Kate had been living pretty much as man and wife in Wales on the island of Anglesey, which is a dot on the world globe. A lot of people did wonder how Kate would cope being so far away from designer shoe shops and civilization. You've got to really love your man if you're going to be up in Anglesey for most of the time. It's cold and rainy. And there was still no engagement. But William was secretly concocting an elaborate plan. He had always had the location in mind, and he always had the ring in mind. His mother's engagement ring, Diana's, which Harry had. Shortly after their mother died, William and Harry went to pick out mementos of their mother. William picked out the Cartier tank watch that his mother always wore. Harry picked out the engagement ring. But the boys had a pact that whoever married first, could have the ring. So William asked Harry, I need that ring. And of course, Harry willingly gave it. William had talked to the Queen and said, look, I'm going to ask Kate to marry me. But I think nobody knew exactly when he was going to do that, uh, apart from him. That October, the couple embarked on another adventure in Kenya. Kate and William had been backpacking around. They'd had a great time. This was the most romantic of settings in a land that has always had a very special meaning for William. He borrowed a helicopter, flew to a lake nestled at the base of Mount Kenya. There in the Kenyan wilderness William loved, he finally popped the question Kate had been waiting for. Even though she's been waiting for this essentially for nine years, I think, uh, Kate was taken by surprise. You know, we were out there with friends and things, so I really didn't expect it at all. I thought he might have sort of maybe thought about it, but no. It was a total shock when it came, and very excited. <laughs> this is, you could say, all she'd been waiting for. I think she was extremely excited and incredibly moved that it was Princess Diana's ring. It's very, very special. 
I love how William has talked about he was carrying around Diana's ring in his rucksack for a couple of weeks, just waiting for the perfect moment to propose to Kate. I literally would not let it go ever I went. I was keeping hold of it because I knew this thing, if it disappeared, I'd be in a lot of trouble. It's there now, safe and secure on, on Kate's finger. Three weeks after returning to England, the couple appeared in a barrage of camera flashes to tell the world. We're really watching history in the making. Kate is the first commoner to marry an heir to the throne in 350 years. And I think everyone's excited that Kate is bringing fresh blood into this family now. She became a proper princess the moment she said, I do. The wedding is a fascinating combination of old and new. William and Kate are totally in control. They are running this show. On the one hand, they are very aware of tradition. The service will be traditional, the vows will be traditional, there will be a royal procession. They're getting married in Westminster Abbey. That's the traditional place for British weddings and coronations. But there will be many personal touches. Kate wants to name the tables after places that they visited together. Also, a little bit of departure from tradition. Instead of jetting off immediately to their honeymoon, they're gonna stay in London their first night so they can hang out and celebrate with their friends. And appropriately, Kate added a Cinderella touch to the royal nuptials. Kate's decided that she won't turn up at the church in a carriage. She'll turn up in a car with her father. She will be leaving by coach. So she is from the beginning saying she wants to arrive as a commoner um, and leave as a princess. Having ridden off in a horse-drawn carriage, the young couple recreated an iconic moment in royal history. They're expected to greet their fans and royals the world over from the balcony of Buckingham Palace and reprise that famous wave and hopefully that famous kiss from 1981. But instead of Charles and Diana, there was William and Kate, the girl who fell in love with her prince from afar and then captured his heart. I think Kate definitely looks beyond William as just a royal prince. They are best friends, which I think is great. It gives uh, the marriage a great start. It does, of course, help that they're beautiful. And there's something about Kate that I think people can identify with. But beyond that, she will be the first college-educated queen. I think she's absolutely perfect for William. I really do believe that this is a fairy tale that's going to have a happy ending. Catherine Elizabeth Middleton secured her place in history when she walked down the aisle of Westminster Abbey on the 29th of April 2011, St. Catherine's Day, when a commoner became a princess. I really hope I can, I can make a difference, you know, even in the, in the smallest way.